Lace from Thailand here and today's video is going to be about Benefits Britain and No Benefits Thailand. One of the big reasons why I left the UK and now living in Thailand. I can speak from experience about this because I used to deal with the people that were on benefits in the UK. So today is going to be a rant because over the past couple of days I've watched a few episodes of Benefits Britain and it sort of wound me up. I've been living here now in Thailand for 10 years and I sort of realised all of this lot was going on 10 years ago and if, if anything it's even worse now compared to No Benefits Thailand. So I'm going to wash the car so it, it might be a long video again, I don't know but it's going to be unscripted and I'll just go on. Now many people say to me I must have the cleanest car in Thailand. Does it get dirty? I'm going to show you a video, yes it does get dirty. So today's the day I'm going to give it a wash. So here we go, Benefits Britain and No Benefits Thailand. And what do I think about it? Well, I've not watched any programs like this for a few years now because I dealt with people on benefits when I was in England and I was trying to get people off benefits in England on various programs that I used to do when I worked for the fire service and the Prince's Trust and I've got to say it was a very difficult time then and it looks even worse now because of the culture of Benefits Britain. Now as I say Thailand here doesn't have a benefit system like that, it really doesn't. Um, if you don't work you get nothing. The old age pension my wife's grandmother is on 500 baht a month pension that's about 12 quid a month so that's all the Thai people get benefits so why do many people like Thailand because it's a poorer country no benefit system and but the people are genuinely appear more happier to live here than the people that are on benefits getting housing benefit getting money for sleeping in bed all day, going into the office once a fortnight or so to sign on so they get their benefits. And even then some of them sleep in and miss their benefits and then complain that they don't get the benefits because they miss their appointment. Who knows? So the talk today is about my experience with working with these people trying to get them off benefits. Now I believe that everybody deserves a chance yeah. and I believe that everybody is, what can I say, want a job or want to better themselves. How many people really want to stay on benefits? You know, it's a demoralizing situation to be in because it's, it's, just looking at the people that, that they don't seem to have any future they don't seem to have any any motivation get the bungo the get the bungo is gone so the story is that I'm going to talk about when I was working for the Prince's Trust and I had some people on my course and my aim was to get them off benefits get them into work get them into a job and improve their lives. Now I was seconded to the Prince's Trust for a year. So I worked in the fire brigade and the fire brigade looked upon it, it was a good move for me to improve my knowledge and my well-being and my uh, working with, with people. So that was their aim to get me moved up the ladder by working with people such as this. It'd be good for my progression with regard to moving on in, in the fire brigade. And I've got to turn around and say it's probably one of the hardest things I've ever done, working with these group of people because the, uh, well, basically the fire brigade, if you tell people what to do, they do what, what they're told. But these people that were on benefits and no motivation, no skills, qualifications and very, very little education. If you told them what to do, it was just like, you're not going to tell me what to do. Who are you to tell me what to do? And they weren't enthusiastic every day at all. 
So you had to be enthusiastic and going at it full pelt and show no weakness with regard to your having a bad day. Because if you were having a bad day with them, they make your day even worse because you've got to be positive all the time. And that was a difficult thing to do, but I did it. And um, I've got to say in its own way, I enjoyed doing it, although it was probably one of the most difficult jobs that I did. That and working for the probation service, um, that was difficult in itself as well, taking people out on a community service. But anyway, I digress that. That's uh, another story with regard to working with these people. So, the uh, Prince's Trust run by Prince Charles in England, for those people who didn't know what the Prince's Trust is about. And it's been set up for a lot, a lot of years and it helps people from 16 up to 25, 30 year olds to gain a job or move on to further education. It's a very, very well run charitable cause and I enjoyed working for it for the year that I did. Although it was very hard, it taught me a lot of things as well as the people that I was teaching so um, so it was a 12-week personal development course and as I say at the end of it they come out with a certificate because they've completed the course and also with forward momentum thinking of either getting a job or moving on to education that was the whole aim of the course and so in, in week 10, they were, they were finishing having two week work experience. So six to eight weeks into it, we got them into looking for jobs and what jobs would they like to do. And basically working for the fire brigade, we could open many doors and we did. We opened quite a few doors for these people, you know, to get access into employment or a taste of employment better than if they could try to do it themselves. For instance, there was this girl who wanted to work in a, a really, really top class hotel. Really, really top class. And she said, no, you can't get me in there, Les, because they, they've never answered my CV. They've never replied to anything. I've tried many times to get into there and I got her in. I got her in there for two weeks, for two weeks trial, and basically the manageress said to me, um, if she's okay, Les, after this two weeks, we'll keep her on. And she sort of said this at the interview. Well, this girl, this girl was absolutely buzzing. She was euphoric, excited that the fact that she'd got into this position. And although she tried to get in there many times herself, she never could even get an answer from this very, very beautiful top class hotel. And um, so it was absolutely superb for me because when I got back to our classroom with the other students they seen what I could do so that absolutely inspired them to think Les can do what he says Les can do miracles and I sort of did you know um, but I was pushing and I was you know forward thinking I, I think outside the box and I do many many good things and that's why people like me on that course because I could achieve and I could get what they really wanted within reasons of course you know and um, anyway this girl who was on the benefit system and uh, she was starting this job and um, on the Monday morning 10 o'clock the manageress from this posh hotel asked me where this girl was and I said isn't she there 
she, she should be there. 10 o'clock, she said she's supposed to start at nine and she's not here. So I'll give this girl a ring on the mobile number. And what do I hear? Who's that? I said, it's Les. It's Les from Prince of Trust. Oh, hello, Les. I'm not going in today. She said, I'm not going in. She said, uh, I'm recovering from a weekend of partying. So I said, said this girl, I was rather angry. I said, listen, I said, this was your dream job. Your dream job. You were so excited about getting in there. I said, listen, I'm going to lie. And I hate lying. I absolutely hate lying. So I won't call it a lie. I told it is a mistruth. And I rang the manageress up and I said, oh, I'm sorry, so I've just been speaking to her. I said, unfortunately, she's had a, a death in the family and going to work was sort of the last thing on her mind. So I said, she'll be in there on Wednesday. For sure, she'll be in there on Wednesday. And I really do hate lying. I don't lie myself. Oh, I tell white lies. I live by moral scruples and principles. And it didn't sit right with me what I said to the lady with regard to her keeping her job, or trying to keep her job. But for me, it was a little sacrifice to hopefully send this girl on her way to a better future. We're, we're all make slip ups and we all do some silly things, so I just class this as a silly little thing. And um, anyway, Wednesday, I rings the manageress up at 10 o'clock. I said, oh yeah, she's here, she's here, lads. She, she was here nice and early at nine o'clock, well presented and, you know, looking smart. And she said, yeah, I think she's gonna enjoy her, her time here. And at one o'clock, the same day, I get a ring from the manageress. She's left, she's gone. She doesn't want to work here anymore, she says. I said, well, why is that? Why is that? She said, oh, come and have an interview with me tomorrow, Les. And she said, I'll explain to her what happened. So I didn't ring this girl up and asked her the reason why. Very disappointed I was. And I goes up to the, up to the hotel the following day and had my discussion with the manageress and she'd got there at nine o'clock she said she was very smart and very willing to start learning and she said we had a wedding on that afternoon on the Wednesday afternoon so she said I got her to start cleaning the silverware the cutlery and the forks and the knives and that and This girl says, I've come to work in your hotel. I haven't come to clean knives and forks. I've come to work here as a receptionist or a something like that. She says, I haven't come here to clean forks and spoons. So she says, you can stick your job where the sun doesn't shine. So you can imagine this top class hotel really, really top class hotel I was totally embarrassed that somebody would speak to somebody of, of authority in this dream job of a location and that she told this manager as she can stick a job not even one day she stuck the job so I never spoke to her for the fortnight and she never rang me up because they had two weeks work experience so they weren't due back in the office for two weeks and when she came back to the office, she said to me, no, she said, I want to be a secretary. She said, or I wanted to be on the desk. She said, I don't want to be cleaning up after everybody else. And I said, I said don't you realise? I said, you've got to start at the bottom and then you work your way up. I said, this was your first day. They didn't know you. You didn't know them. So it was just a sort of getting used to the way you tick and the way you go on. So I said, what do you think your attitude shows to them? She said, I don't care, I don't care. I never want to work for them. So I said, well, on the positive side, now you know 
you don't want to work in a top class hotel. So what else do you want to do? And she said, I don't know. So then after the two weeks placement, there was a number of people came back after their two weeks work experience and realized the jobs that they want to do weren't the jobs that they wanted to do. So then me being on the positive side, I said, okay then let's see what jobs you can do. Let's face it, you've all got no skills, qualifications or education or very little education. So what do you think you can offer everybody out there who's looking for work? It, potential employers. And um, of course the answer was, we've got nothing to, to offer them. So because I'm a big thinker out of the box, I had ways and means of uh, rescuing the situation. So I was saying that the way forward, just a minute, got me cloth. So the way forward was to be self-employed. If you're self-employed, you're your own boss. And doing my exercise on the board with regard to what jobs you can do, with regard to being self-employed, in which you can, become self-employed and I had five jobs five jobs that offered you the chance of becoming self-employed and the first job that I'm going to talk about what I offered them a guy came into our into our offices and he had a window cleaning round and he offered that for sale well not he didn't want to sell it he wanted to give it to us sorry but if nobody took him up on the offer, he was going to sell it. And he wanted to offer it to somebody that was willing to take over the round. And he would personally go around with them on a two week start up and introduce them to all of his, his clients and say this girl or this chap is going to take over my window cleaning round. So before I told them it was a window cleaning round, I said to them, who wants to earn £35,000 a year being self-employed, work when you want, you know, have maybe six weeks holiday a year, and employ maybe as a friend, and you could earn £54,000 a year. So I did all of the, the maths on the, on the board, and I had 10 eager hands. Yeah, 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 I want that. Yeah, 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 I want that. I want to earn 35,000 pounds a year. And then I said, the job is a window cleaner. Oh, window cleaner, window cleaner, he said. Now this was before the day of working at height regulations come in and working off ladders, cleaning the windows were sort of frowned upon you can't do that because of health and safety health and safety has been the ruin of many a job so so bear in mind this is like maybe 15 years or so ago now and when i said the window cleaning around everybody said, uh, i don't want to clean windows it's a scummy job but at the time i was a firefighter and i was on twenty-eight thousand pounds a year and i said this window cleaning job i said pays more than my job of being a firefighter so of course the answer is, well, why don't you become a window cleaner then? And actually, I did have my own window cleaning business when I first joined the fire brigade. I bought it off another fireman and I made a lot of money doing part-time window cleaning. So I've been there, I've done it. I know what it's like, I know how much money you could earn from it. And uh, so this window cleaner, who genuinely offered to a, a good candidate this opportunity of earning £35,000 a year at least nobody took him up on his offer so he sold the window cleaning round business you know and I thanked him very much for making the offer and trying to improve people's lives it was a very very kind and generous donation that nobody took him on so of course the other jobs and that that I offered that I said um, 
you know, where you can start up being a self-employed fence erector. No, no, you need a van, you need a van. I said, no, you don't. Why do you need a van? I said, you need a very good telephone manner and to be able to order all the stuff and get it delivered at the houses that you're going to be working at. I said, and carry your tools in a rucksack, get a bus to work. I said, it doesn't take a lot to get started. And I said, once you start building up your business, then you can start buying vans and things like that. But I said, if you've got nothing to start with, you've got to make do and you've got to figure out ways of moving on. No, nobody's interested in that. Absolutely nobody was interested. So I explained the other jobs and they're all on a similar sort of vein doing that. And uh, I used to be a, a face painter and have bouncy castles and children's entertainment business. I said, you know, learn face painting. You can earn £100, £200 a day being a face painter. No, 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 I don't want to do that. I even had the course contacts, the course that I went on, I paid £45. And I literally made hundreds and hundreds of pounds being a face painter. Now, I'm no good as an artist, but the simple steps that they taught you, it was easy to do. And when I opened my own children's leisure business with bouncy castles, I did, did that. Face painting, and then I did temporary tattoos, which again, just another money earner. And balloon models, balloon modeling. Going up Redcar High Street, earning £200 a day, £250 a day on a weekend, doing balloon modelling. Squeak, squeak, bang, wallop, give kids the balloon. Little happy kids, because they've got a balloon. Used to cost me six pence a balloon, and I used to sell them at a pound each. I used to give maybe four or five balloons away at the beginning of the day to these kids, and once another kid sees another kid with a balloon, I want one, I want one, I want one. That's how it works. So I'm always thinking out of the box. But I'm afraid this benefits culture, Britain, it spoiled it for everybody because nobody wants to work. Nobody wants to get off benefits because it's such an easy job getting off benefits. Sorry, not an easy job to get off. It's a hard job to get off benefits. It's a hard job even to get back onto benefits so nobody will leave it. So these programs I used to watch infuriated me and thinking, look where I'm living. This is beautiful. This is far, far better than my lifestyle that I lived in England because I worked for it, because I looked outside of the box, because I wanted to change my life and I did it. So for those people who were thinking about retiring and moving, moving from England, there is a better life outside of England. You just need to look and talk to the people that actually live it find out how they did it, and go and do the same. So from Les, this is a bit of a long one, retiring and living the dream. Until the next video, bye for now.